Great. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. <laughs> so as was probably said before, um, feel free to share uh, these slides and adapt them to your own liking, as long as you have proper attribution and licensing. Uh, so this is module six, where I'm going to be talking about cell-cell communication. Um, over the course of this lecture, I hope you'll take away uh, the role and context of cell-cell communication, how we can use uh, single cell technologies in order to extract cell cellular transcriptomes in order to better identify communication, uh, some general principles about how most of these algorithms can work, uh, some of the more detailed inner workings of a select few communication detection algorithms, um, how we can maybe improve the robustness of this detection through spatial transcriptomics, and lastly, ending with uh, the creation of one of our own uh, from our own lab, uh, uh, spatially resolved cells of communication tools. So how do cells uh, communicate? There's a variety of different kinds of mechanisms. Uh, it's not through cell phones. It's generally through the uh, ligand receptor pairs. So basically, uh, people can see the mouse. Is this? Yeah. Um, through a uh, sender cell will secrete a ligand protein, which will bind to a cognate receptor on a receiver uh, cell. And this will form that communication. Um, so there are many different types of mechanisms for this ligand receptor pair based communication. For example, you can have autocrine where the cell secretes ligand that's picked up by its own uh, receptors on the cell surface. There's paracrine, where the lichen can travel a short distance and bind to the receiver cell a short distance away. Uh, there's juxtacrine, where there has to be um, direct cell-cell contact. And endocrine, where the ligand can travel through the endocrine system uh, a very far um, distance away within the body. Usually this is through hormones. Um, and so why do we care about all this communication? Well, upon binding to a receptor on the cell surface, this will initiate a cascading event of signal transduction where one protein will activate another protein, which will phosphorylate another protein, which will then form a complex and activate more proteins. And it can even translocate into the nucleus uh, through, uh, for instance, transcription factors, which can regulate gene expression. Uh, this can have uh, major effects within the cell, altering its behavior through different pathways such as apoptosis or cellular proliferation or initiating an adaptive immune response, all these different kinds of functionalities. And so you can imagine that the dysregulation of these communications uh, can lead to um, conditions such as different kinds of diseases. For example, in my lab in particular, we're interested in cancer and how um, the dysregulation of these signals can cause um, uh, resistance to therapy. So you could imagine having a very diverse tumor with many different cell states and cell clones uh, upon treatment with a drug such as chemotherapy or uh, targeted therapy. While most of these cells may be eliminated, there might be a few that survive into minimal residual disease, maybe from cell cell communication. And upon a drug holiday, it might grow out and cause relapse. So as a result, you know, Labs like us are very interested in cell cell communication and how it plays a role in this kind of behavior. Um, and we hypothesize that this is happening because what we notice is across different kinds of models that we used in xenograft models and in cell lines, across colorectal cancer and T cell lymphoblastic leukemia, when we look at the most differentially expressed genes between the minimal residual disease, the treated, uh, cells versus the control, we see that some of the, those most differentially expressed genes are involved in cell-cell communication. Furthermore, uh, a lot of our past projects where we create different kinds of tools, um, whether we're looking across different kinds of cancers or we're looking at the same cancer across different individuals or within uh, even a single cell line or a single cancer sample, there can be a lot of this heterogeneity. A lot of the diseases that we've covered, such as acute myeloid leukemia, or T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia are um, driven by mutations within their cell surface receptors. So, you know, this kind of leads us all to believe that there's the cell-cell communication contributing to progression and this poor therapy response. 
So how can we actually go about detecting and answering these kinds of questions with the tools that we have? Well, first off, a lot of this was not really possible until the advent of single cell sequencing. So just as a, a brief primer on this, um, you have this uh, tissue, which I represent here as a fruit bowl, and different cells, this is a very popular way of <laughs> doing this kind of explanation, uh, have uh, each uh, cell represent a different kind of fruit. And uh, if you do bulk RNA sequencing, which is what we used to do in the past, you essentially uh, create a smoothie and sh shred up all of your, your cells into the slurry that's an average uh, signal, uh, transcriptomic signal from your sample. As you can imagine, you can't really detect signals happening between cell types or different kinds of cells if you're just getting a single signal. So uh, using single cell transcriptomics, we can actually isolate the transcripts from each one of these cells uh, by barcoding them. And then we still have the information of which transcript came from which cell. And we can then look at the communication occurring between each cell type. Um, so how does this data, uh, how, do, how does this actually work? Well, um, the, the, first off, the spatial transcriptomics is uh, becoming more and more popular, as I'm sure many of you have seen. Uh, ever since around 2018, there's been exponential growth. This is mainly due to the increased number of technologies that can sequence more and more cells uh, for cheaper and cheaper costs. Um, and some of the most popular ones uh, include the Chromium controller, which I'll briefly go over how it works uh, due to its popularity and its availability in many of the institutions around here as well. Um, so this is using a microfluidics platform. So the way this works is you have these barcoded gel beads and on each one of these gel beads, you have these oligonucleotides with a partial Illumina uh, sequence along with a barcode uh, so this will uh, de uh, determine which transcripts came from which cells. All of these kind of tags have that same barcode, but then that's also attached to a unique molecular identifier in order to control for um, how many re uh, reads are being attributed to each transcript. And lastly, a poly DT tail, which can bind to the poly A tail of the transcripts in order to um, attach them to this bead. And so cells are kind of fed through uh, along with the beads and um, they're captured in these kind of bubbles surrounded by oil. And in theory, there should be about one cell uh, for each one of these beads. Um, you can then use reverse transcription in order to get the cDNA of the transcript along with their, these barcodes. Um, and then you can uh, pull everything together by removing the oil and then do normal kind of Illumina sequencing in order to um, sequence the entire transcript along with the barcode. So now you know which transcript came from which uh, cells. And so um, here's an example that won't work because I'm using a different program. That's all right. It looks really cool. <laughs> uh, <laughs> trust me on that. So um, the typical workflow uh, will generally uh, end up with a uh, map that looks like this, where each one of these dots it represents a single cell, and they're kind of similar to each other within gene expression space. Uh, the way you get this is by having all those transcripts as output from the Illumina machine in like a BCL file. Uh, you usually use a program like Cell Ranger or another kind of alignment tool in order to get the barcodes uh, representing each cell in this matrix. Uh, along with the number of reads that were found in that cell uh, aligned with a particular gene. So you'll have a matrix that's, you know, however many cells are in your data set, uh, how many barcodes you had, uh, along with about 20,000 or so uh, different gene features. And so from this matrix, you can use um, dimensionality reduction techniques such as principal components analysis or TMAP or, U uh, sorry, TISNI or UMAP in order to collapse all these features down to usually two vectors in order to uh, visualize on a Cartesian coordinate system. Um, then once you have uh, the kind of location of these cells, usually you use a um, marker-based strategy uh, where you can say, oh, this cell had a high expression of CD4 and CD8 and CD3, therefore it's probably a T cell any of these manual kind of ways of doing it, or you can use a cell annotation software 
such as um, Castle or Cell Typist, which will use kind of a reference single cell RNA sequencing um, uh, data set in order to match your data set with what they have in order to see, uh, okay, these are this is probably a fibroblast because its transcriptomic profile is similar to the reference uh, uh, the, the reference transcriptome. And so that's how you can get the cell types uh, attributed to each one of these profiles. And feel free to, to interrupt if anybody has any questions. Uh, I know. Yes. Um, so, so that's what I was just uh, referring to. So that's what that you can use a manual marker based approach. You know, if you have a high CD3, it's more likely to be a T cell, right? Um, or you can use a cell annotation tool. Uh, and these will basically... <laughs> oh, sure. I mean the technology itself. Yeah. So, so um, all of the transcripts from that cell will, uh, well, not all of them, but <laughs> hopefully a good portion, uh, will bind to the bead, right, with the poly A tail. And so these have a 10x barcode attached to them. So all of those tags on this bead have the same barcode. And if you just have one cell within this bubble, then, or droplet, then you should have uh, uh, all of the transcripts having that same barcode. And so you know that that belonged to that cell. Does that make sense? You don't know what cell it is. Uh, uh, what, do, what do you mean, which cell? Like, so you have a mixture of cells in the bucket, yeah. and then it defines the bead. Yeah. I don't, I don't know which cell type it is. You're going to have to do that algorithmically from a program like this. Yeah. Um, yeah. So once you, so it's not perfect, but <laughs> it's the best we have so far, right? Um, so once you have your, your predicted cell type, uh, along with the transcriptome, now we can start uh, running cell-cell communication algorithms. So one of the earliest ones to come onto the scene was cell phone DB. Um, this introduced uh, the cell phone DB database um, in order to kind of manually curate a bunch of protein-protein interactions and other ligand receptor uh, pairs um, to kind of match your different signals with. Uh, this is version one. Uh, they're up to version five now, I believe. Um, and it has thousands of different protein-protein uh, interactions and thousands of secreted and membrane proteins, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, mostly we focus on this ligand receptor pairs within the the cell-cell um, communication field just because it's, it's more, I guess, straightforward to do at this stage. But the concepts are very similar of how you would uh, detect these throughout. So uh, what do the, this database, uh, what does this database look like? Well, it comes in a uh, form of several different spreadsheets. Uh, so for example, here's the interaction spreadsheet where it will have the uh, numerical or string based ID of that interaction. It will have the sender molecule and the receiver molecule along with the, uh, these are again IDs. Uh, along with um, the source, so what data set it came from, Uniprod, or maybe it came from some publication. Um, it said whether it was manually curated or not, whether it's protein-protein interaction. Uh, it also will say what kind of uh, communication it is, for example, the adhesion by collagen. Uh, to find out more information about the sender and receiver molecules, there's this multi-data spreadsheet um, the, these are much longer. I'm cutting it off, by the way. I don't have a dot, 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 but these are much longer, um, obviously. Uh, and so you have the numerical and string names for the um, each molecule, along with whether it is a receptor or not, or a ligand, and whether it's secreted or it's a transmembrane protein or peripheral or integrin. So you can find out more information about each one of these uh, candidates molecules from these kinds of spreadsheets. Um, so with these databases, uh, you now go through your algorithm in order to identify whether communication is occurring. So cell phone DB came with kind of a, a, a simple one to start out with. You essentially have uh, your clustered single cell RNA sequencing data um, along with your, your database of known ligand receptor pairs that are known to bind together. Uh, and essentially what they did was they looked at the average expression from a candidate sender cluster or cell type 
uh, and see if the, another cluster has a high expression of the cognate receptor gene expression. If so, then they kind of have this candidate, you know, cluster one is talking to cluster two um, with these, you know, this mean value. Uh, to see whether it's statistically significant or not, they basically do a, um, a permutation test. Well, they will randomly shuffle the cluster assignments to each one of these cells and see whether their observed mean uh, is larger than what they would get from that shuffle. And if uh, that null distribution of the shuffle is much, much smaller than the observed, then we know that that's probably going to have a very low p-value. It's probably statistically significant that these two clusters are uh, communicating with that particular ligand receptor pair. Um, there's a lot of customizability for this kind of process. <clears throat> for example, uh, within cell phone DB, they only consider ligands and receptors that are greater that are present in greater than 10% of the cells within that cluster. Uh, they ra randomly permuted the cluster labels a thousand times. I would recommend maybe doing a bit more just because uh, permutation tests require many permutations in order to be reliable. Um, they calculate the proportions of means as more extreme than what you would observe. And uh, if there is a protein dimer, uh, just like they have here, that's A and B, um, they want to look at the minimum gene expression because you can't have kind of a lot from one of the dimers and half from the other and expect there to be more than the smaller of the two. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, then with kind of these ligands and receptor pairs, identified, you can visualize it in a variety of different ways. Here you can use something like Python iGraph, uh, for example, to show that the CD4 cluster is talking to the dendritic cell cluster. Uh, the darker the, the edge, the more ligand receptor pairs are, were found to be communicating between these uh, two populations. Okay, so this is kind of the general kind of overview of many of these types of algorithms to get started. So again, you, you uh, just as in cell phone DB, you collect your single cell RNA sequencing or what have you from uh, your sample. You have this in a matrix format for your genes within cells. Uh, you combine this with your ligand receptor pair database into these candidate uh, pairs. You have some kind of scoring function with the ligand and receptor expression as input in order to see if they're really communicating or not, and then you visualize it in some way. So a lot of it is just like variations on this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, scheme. So a few different kinds of scoring functions that you can use uh, are, for example, expression thresholding. So this is kind of what cell phone DB use, where they said, oh, greater than 10% must be considered, right? So this is similar where you're saying, if the ligand expression in my distribution is high enough, and if the receptor expression, the cognate receptor expression gene expression is high enough, then these are communicating, right? That's a one or a zero, is communicating or not. But you could also have an expression product by just multiplying these values together. Uh, this is actually kind of nice because it controls for cases where you can have a, an extremely high receptor gene expression, but if you have zero for your ligand expression, then your overall uh, expression product will be zero, right? It's not communicating at all. So that's nicely controlling for that. So this is a continuous um, uh, uh, function. You can have similarly an expression correlation where you have increased ligand expression correlated with increased re receptor expression, similar to the expression product, which is also continuous. You can also do kind of this differential expression, right? This fold change between the ligand and receptor samples or, or cell clusters. Uh, what's nice about this is um, you also get a p-value associated with it. So instead of just having a single cutoff of saying, oh, it's, it's this highly expressed or this highly differentially expressed, you can now also cut off based on what is significant or not, right? Um, but this is binary. Uh, so as you can see, you know, we can start to increase the, num the, the, the space of the kinds of um, ways to interpret cell-cell communication. Um, for a very extremely different way of doing things, for example, uh, you can replace not only the ligand receptor pair scoring, but also the, mo the underlying model of communication itself. 
for example, this is what CellChat does. It uses the law of mass action um, in order to model not only the ligand receptor pair expression, but also take into account co-inhibitory and co-stimulatory receptors and agonists and antagonists. Um, and again, you'll, you'll see this, this very common theme where you get the uh, ligand receptor pair database, you pass that through to your data where you get the cell groups like those clusters, either through clustering or through uh, the latent space that you cluster on top of, and you get those overexpressed genes per cell group. And then this is where they have like this new kind of model. So for example, they use um, their law of mass action, which is based uh, essentially uh, um, um, providing the value for the dissociation constant, constant as part of a Hill equation. <coughs> so they use Hill equations all over the place in their model. Um, <clears throat> the Hill equation is uh, basically the definition of the fraction of receptor protein that's bound by ligand. And this is defined as that ligand concentration raised to a Hill coefficient. Uh, this Hill coefficient uh, will vary um, uh, if it's less than one. Um, basically, that means that when, when uh, the ligand is bound to a receptor, it is less likely to bind to more uh, ligands. A receptor is less likely to bind to more ligands and vice versa. Uh, if it's greater than one, that means that um, the, if it's bound by a ligand, it's more likely to be bound by more ligands. Um, cell chat just sets this to one, so I'm not going to be really talking about it. Uh, that just means it's kind of independent of how many uh, uh, ligands uh, receptors are bound. Um, so basically, it's defining the ligand concentration divided by the ligand concentration plus the dissociation constant uh, from the law of mass action, which is basically what is the receptor uh, at half binding concentration. Um, so in cell chat, they define this as 0 0.5. Uh, the reason why is they normalize all of their gene expression you know, concentrations to be between zero and one. So half binding would be 0 0.5. So with that in mind, again, this is that fraction of receptor protein bound by ligand. They use Hill equation, equations all over their, their model. So basically, the probability that a sender cell type I is talking to a sender cell type J with uh, ligand and receptor pairs uh, of L and R are defined first by this Hill equation of the ligand receptor, uh, ligand, the average ligand receptors multiplied uh, gene expression multiplied by the average receptor gene expression on the receiver cell type. Um, and these are defined not just by the expression, but it's the geometric mean of M1 subunits of the ligand, just in case there are additional subunits. Uh, same with the receptor is the M2 subunits. But this one is also modulated by the average of uh, co-stimulatory and co-inhibitory uh, uh, receptors. Okay, so um, that's this component. That's just kind of like the the ligand and receptor expression multiplied together, ana analogous to that. Um, the second component is they're just multiplying it by modulating with agonists. So they have the Hill equation now for agonists from sender I or receiver J. And then the second part is modulating with antagonists from sender I and receiver J. Um, but you'll notice the difference is that the antagonists have the dissociation constant on top. Right? So this is for the dissociation. This is where uh, you have the competition for binding that the antagonists are blocking. Um, and lastly, they weigh this whole equation by the uh, numbers of cells belonging to each cell type. So Ni is the number of cells for sender cell I and J sender cell type I. And Nj is the number of cells for receiver cell type J. Uh, divided by the total number of uh, cells within the data set squared. So um, this is kind of how cell chat does it to have a more, uh, they say, robust way of, of modeling the probability of these, um, these, these communication scores. Uh, yes? Does this take into account the distance from one cell to another or just no. specific? Okay. No, and that's important for the second half of this talk. <laughs> but yes, so, so that's a huge problem. 
um, which can potentially lead to a lot of false uh, negatives and positives. Um, but yes, yes. Oh, uh, but cell chat version two, I believe is on BioArchive and they're purporting to take that into account. And I think it's through thresholding. I think they say, oh, if you're, oh, don't quote me on this. But <laughs> I think it's like, I think it's based off of a threshold of distance and then they have a similar model. But yeah, so this is the original one from 2021, 2024 or whatever, uh, the BioArchive, I don't think it's published yet. Um, they're trying to take that into account as well. Yeah. So all of this is based on like cluster of cells. So yes, like identical cell types or similar cell types. What happens in cases where you have like a subset of cell type A talking to a subset of cell type B? Is that just completely missed? In the yes, or? you'd have to um, you'd have to do subclustering in order to find that out. However, there are very, very, very few algorithms that try single cell, including ours, uh, based uh, communication. Um, but the vast majority that you'll see will do cluster cluster. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Kim, you that the spatial would be a solution to that, right? Spatial transcriptome. Yes. What about spatial transcriptome? And then you could, that, that would solve the problem of how close the cells are to each other. Yes, exactly. I, I'm going to go over that uh, too. Yeah. Um, yes. <clears throat> so um, there's many kinds of methods that do the cell cell communication. There's cell phone DB, cell chat. Connectome has one, single cell signal R, scribe in, NatMe. There's many out there. Um, so actually, one of the other algorithms called Liana attempts to kind of create a consensus of all of these communication algorithms. So they'll take, uh, it takes uh, many different. Uh, databases that were identified along with, you got to be careful though, some of these are, are repeats, like OmniPath is also trying to collect a lot of these data sets as well, but I'm sure it's all normalized and, uh, and controlled for. Um, and then uh, it takes a whole bunch of different methods and it finds a consensus along with your clustered single cell RNA-seq data to identify a more robust cell-cell uh, communication uh, mapping. Okay, um, and I, I believe you're going to be using Liana later as well. Um, okay, so uh, what can you do once you have, you know, this uh, sender cell type I and receiver cell type J with this ligand receptor pair? What, what can you do with that? Well, you can do differential, different, uh, traditional differential expression analysis, um, which I believe is covered in other modules as well, uh, where you just look at the uh, difference in expression patterns between these signals. You could do a traditional pathway analysis like GSCA with these genes that you've identified or, um, or Metascape or any of these. Um, but what's neat about having this kind of communication network is that you can use a lot of graph theory based uh, 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 measures as well in order to identify, for example, clicks within these networks. So for example, uh, a definition of a click is uh, within a graph, if every, uh, a click is where every uh, vertex is connected with an edge to every other vertex in that click. So for example, uh, you would interpret each one of these uh, vertices as a uh, cell cluster, or if it's a single cell based algorithm, a single cell. Uh, the edge is the ligand receptor communication between uh, between the vertices, the cell types. Um, and so a one click would just be each node itself. A uh, two click would be all of the edges within the network because they're all connecting the nodes between them. Uh, a three click are these uh, light gray because there are three cells uh, types and they're all interconnected with each other. Uh, four clicks are these dark, darker blue. So you can get the idea but it's showing these regions of your data set that are highly connected and talking to each other. Um, you can also look at graph centrality. So this basically defines which vertices within your network are the most easily accessible by every other ver vertex in the network. So this, with this, you can find, uh, for example, cell types that are uh, very easily reachable through like a cascading event. Um, 
And there are many different ways to measure graph centrality. You can do uh, this, for instance, degree, which is just like the number of edges that the cell uh, that the uh, that the vertices have. Uh, you can have eigenvector and cats. Uh, cats is a variant of the eigenvector, uh, which basically not just defines centrality for individual vertices, but also uh, is weighed by the centrality of its neighbors as well. So th there are many different ways to define, you know, what is the center of a network. But these kinds of uh, methods can help you identify um, those central cell types in your data set. You can also look at hubs. Um, these are kind of highly visited uh, vertices within the network. Um, so here's an example from, from neuroscience. They, they term these provincial hubs and connector hubs. So the provincial hub is within a cluster. Uh, you have a very highly connected node. And um, the, uh, the connector hub is uh, a highly connected node between different uh, clusters here. They call them modules. But yeah. So you can have different definitions of these hubs as well. Um, so that's great. And we're very excited to use all these tools in order to answer the question of whether it contributes to progression and poor therapy response. However, as was mentioned earlier, this single transcriptomic layer is not really that helpful in uh, answering our particular question. Uh, the reason being uh, is that um, as some people mentioned, if you have a cell on one side of the tissue and a cell on the, the complete opposite side of the tissue, all that information is lost when you do single cell RNA sequencing, uh, traditional single cell RNA sequencing. <clears throat> and, um, and obviously we would not expect these to be communicating with each other. So that's a lot of false positives can happen. Uh, in addition, labs such as the, the Bader lab uh, at here at U of T and others have identified using the connectivity map, uh, which uses the L1000 assay, which is basically a data set that measures gene expression in response uh, across many cell lines uh, in response to many different ligands that um, they were treated with. They saw that only about 6% of the gene expression was actually significantly differentially expressed. Um, if you look at individual cells, types, uh, the number does go up, but it's still pretty low. So, you know, you have to ask yourself whether such a low percentage can actually be captured by a lot of these algorithms if you're just looking at the transcriptome. So there's been a big push recently to use um, newer technologies that uh, are kind of multi-omic, that use additional facets of information, such as spatial transcriptomics, because with this kind of tool, you can uh, spatially resolve where your transcriptomes are on the tissue. Uh, so how does this work? Um, again, there's a few methods out there. I'm just going to be talking about Visium because that's one of the more common ones. <coughs> um, and now they have Visium HD, but for now I'm just going to talk about the standard Visium. Uh, you can essentially have a slide with four different sections or samples that you can place on the slide. Um, you place it onto this uh, 6.5 millimeter by 6.5 millimeter square which uh, has a bunch of what we call spots on top of it. And these spots, just like the single cell RNA sequencing, have these oligonucleotides that uh, uh, contain uh, the Illumina partial read along with a spatial barcode, unique molecular identifier, and the PolyDT uh, tail. I forgot to mention there are 55 micrometers in diameter and 100 micrometers uh, center to center distance. Um, and so from this, when you do that same process as before, you put the tissue on top, um, when you make it permeable, the, uh, the, the transcripts will float down and be captured by these and bind to these, uh, uh, these tags. And then you can, um, pull everything together, sequence, and now you kind of have an X, Y grid system of each one of these transcripts. Um, so we kind of use that for our own research as well, where we were looking at pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma <coughs> um, uh, in collaboration with the NADA lab at OICR and uh, Princess Margaret. And um, we have our own uh, question of trying to identify that cell cell communication that's spatially resolved on tissue. So we developed our own kind of custom uh, tool for this, which I'll go over. Um, so how does this data actually look like? Uh, so this is a slide of uh, pancreatic cancer tissue. These darker regions are the tumor regions. So when annotated by a pathologist, 
uh, these blue kind of spots. Again, each one of these is the sequence spots uh, from spatial transcriptomics. The blue spots are the tumor regions and the orange spots are the stroma regions. And so um, it's important to note that there are uh, multiple different subtypes of pancreatic cancer. For example, basal and classical, where classical has uh, a higher overall survival than basal. And so one of our main questions was, as you can see here, there appear to be pretty distinct uh, groupings of basal or classical uh, tumor regions um, uh, based off of their molecular profiles. And so one of our questions was, is the communication different between this class, the, the region surrounding the classical versus the region surrounding the basal or the mixed region? Um, so in order to answer that question, we need to find a, a way to c integrate the spatial information along with the um, transcriptomic information. So first what we did is uh, Fatima Zahora, who's a postdoc in the lab, decided to use graph convolutional networks in order to um, kind of combine this information together. So the way this works is we represent each uh, vertex within a graph uh, as the spot and the edge between spots as the distance between the spots within the uh, assay. And so each one of these spots has about the 20,000 or so different genes associated with them. So here I'm simplifying that down to four genes, so a four vector. Uh, we look at the, the one hop away for simplicity, but you can look at two hops away or three hops away, but here we'll just look at the nearest neighbors. You look at the same uh, genes, pile them up, sum them together to get kind of an aggregated neighborhood uh, gene. And you do this for every gene within this um, network. And you feed these as features, as new features through an encoder, which is a type of neural network, uh, which will take those that information and collapse it into kind of a, a reduced dimensional space called an embedding. Um, and uh, the way that you kind of do this is you start off with, with random weights for each one of these edges uh, and you basically uh, uh, the, this node is defined as the weighed uh, sum of all of the previous nodes that are connected to that node multiplied by each one of those weights. Does that make sense? It's kind of a mouthful. But... Okay. Um, yeah. So these are uh, randomly initiated at first. Um, and then you get this new embedding that kind of represents your surrounding neighborhood, right? Uh, this is one way to kind of aggregate and, and, and integrate this information together. Uh, one problem with using a method like this is that we don't actually know what these weights should be. So uh, they're randomly initiated, but you're supposed to learn what the correct, quote unquote, weights should be um, based off of a ground truth. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a ground truth or any kind of training data set because we don't know which spots you know, should uh, be talking or communicating with, with which other spots or what these transcriptomes should be looking like or anything like that. So how do we learn without a training set? So uh, Fatima got the idea to use uh, uh, deep graph Infomax to uh, kind of learn without a training set. So the way this works is that you take this kind of um, uh, uh, strategy and you then um, you basically mimic it, but your input graph is now what we call a corrupted graph, where we completely randomly shuffle the edges within this network. And so you do the same process where you look at that node of interest, you look at the surrounding vertices, you pile them up, and you do the same exact process. This encoder, importantly, is the same encoder with the same weights. Um, <clears throat> and you, you get nonsense, basically. This is like a null distribution. Um, and what you do is you take your embedding that you got from your observed encoder and you compare it with uh, the kind of final versions that you're getting for the embedding from the observed versus the uh, kind of nonsense corrupted embedding that you get uh, from your, your, your null distribution. And the weights that led to this embedding, you kind of downgrade the weights that led to this embedding, you, you give more weight to, 
right? So you do this over, you know, 50, 100 or more epochs, you'll eventually learn what these weights should be for your particular sample. Does all that make sense? Or kind of? Okay. Um, <laughs> let me know if you have any questions. Sure, that, that's why I figure like, like if, if it's not entirely clear, um, I can maybe try and uh, 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 clarify it or, yeah. How do you take into account like growth factors being released from one cell? They may grow 100 microns, then they grow 40 microns, and then that affects the cell genotype at that point. Is that somehow intuited, or are you assuming that you know genes expressed like far away if they're similar to the cell that you're analyzing in this case? And if it's similar, then you can put that closer to the known. So how does this relate to cell cell communication? Yeah. Okay, not yet. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. But um, so this is kind of uh, me trying to tell you guys how, how the graph convolutional network works um, overall before getting into how to apply to communication. So right now, this is kind of just grouping together a neighborhood to see like what, what parts of the uh, tissue belong to which neighborhoods. Um, yes. About this, kind of following up. Yeah. One is that uh, so there is some literature I think is talking about how far cytokines go in the tissue. Mm. Like I don't know if you guys looked at those papers. We we know. did. Um, I don't I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, for paracrine signaling is usually what they're talking about of what what is the distance. They're mostly from like biophysics based articles. Um, this was for us determining how many hops away we should look. Um, but uh, uh, I don't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head. So what I remember is that like uh, Paul Fuchs from Calgary, Alberta, they published in 2004, I think they burned a hole into the liver and they looked how the ventricles migrate to that sterile injury. Mm. And they looked at, you know, different inhibitions, where do they stop the cells? So I think the conclusion was that roughly 100 or 50 micron are the layer, mm -hmm. that, you know, that the cytokine signaling switches. So my, my guess would have been is that so 50 to 100 micron is how far the signal propagates in the tissue. But it's a liver and a burn, it's a mouse. Yeah. And the, the other thing what I was thinking of, so if I remember right, the MishNet considers the signatures that the, uh, so did you guys look at that too? Um, so, so there's a few out there that also do um, <clears throat> like pathway, uh, like receptor pathway downstream analysis. That was for a future date. Um, but we, we don't at the moment. Um, the, all of these different methods are trying to, to do kind of like, what can we do to make it more reliable? You know, the niche net, um, from what I remember, does not do necessarily this kind of spatial integration, right? So um, there's a, some others that kind of attempt to do that. Uh, Kamat, C-O-M-M-O-T, uh, attempts to do um, some kind of spatial uh, 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 ensemble of experts approach um but yeah it's uh we we don't we don't have any kind of uh signature we're ours is like completely unbiased and do you think using signatures traditionally as an evidence that the signaling actually happens in the cell do you think it adds a lot to the confidence that i don't know okay. that's a great question though that's a it's a good question but i i don't know um Again, a lot of a, a big issue with the social communication is the lack of a ground truth, right, to compare it to. So it's like, do we know that this signal is happening from this spot to this spot or this cell to this cell? Um, I, we don't know at this moment in time. The best we can do is some, I'll show you uh, an example of one of the validations. Um, but yeah, that's the best we can do at this time. Um, okay, so. Uh, so how well uh, does this kind of integration work? Um, so as I was mentioning earlier, like to see what kind of, uh, uh, if we can identify different kind of neighborhoods within the tissue, um, if we just cluster each one of these spots by the transcriptomes and don't take into spatial anything whatsoever uh, using like a Louvain clustering algorithm, we can get kind of this uh, confetti looking uh, clusters with some kind of structure, but generally you could see that there's not too much of a spatial impact on these um, nodes. 
However, if we use the same clustering algorithms uh, uh, on top of the embedding, we can actually identify what appears to be more of a spatially aware clustering algorithm, right? So it appears to be working. And also a lot of these, you can ignore these numbers, they're, they're associated with the cluster ID, um, but they <clears throat> appear to be associated with the cancer regions of the tissue. Um, so it appears to be working like we would expect. But, um, you know, this is just the neighborhoods. It's not actually cell-cell communication. How do we actually determine which uh, uh, spots or cells, this also works for single cell, I should mention, um, but which cells are, are talking to which other cells? Um, and this is important to know because pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma is widely known to have an extremely uh, dense tumor microenvironment with many, many different kinds of tumor promoting signals and immunosuppressive signals um, going back and forth. Uh, so um, I kind of simplified this, you can imagine, uh, a little bit. Uh, it's not just a sum of these genes. It's actually a weighed sum of the genes. But the reason why that might be important is because you can imagine this kind of toy network that looks like this. Um, uh, if, if we picture this as like a social network and we're interested in learning more about this individual uh, based off of the friends that she follows, um, but she also follows a celebrity that has many, many, many different kinds of followers. We're trying to learn about what kind of food this person likes, what kind of movies this person likes. Um, <clears throat> you can imagine that we're going to learn more from her immediate friends because they ate out at some restaurant uh, on Friday night. And they all got similar food and they enjoyed it and are sharing pics about it uh, versus this celebrity who went to Paris and ate at a fancy patisserie and ate it somewhere that these people will never eat at, right? So we can actually um, downgrade this kind of edge uh, based off of the number of the, the degree of what they're connected to. And so this can give us kind of a, a new weighed sum for input into the encoder. And this is important to know because it says that, oh, we can attach weights to these edges. And if we can attach weights to this, that means that we can probably learn about uh, these weights, right? We can feed these into the neural network as well. And indeed we can, and these are called graph attention networks. Um, attention as a mechanism has been increasingly popular, especially since the advent of chat GPT where I asked it if it uses an attention model, and it says that yes, it, it does use an attention model, and that uh, attention mechanism allows it to assign varying levels of importance to different parts of the input. So we got an idea that, oh, we can uh, then assign these varying levels of importance to an input, so what if we change the input, instead of the, the vertices, we change it to the edges, and have the edges be the cell-cell um, communication. So uh, as a result, we now can say that these edges are uh, uh, feature vectors containing the precise ligand receptor type, the distance between the, these two spots, along with the ligand receptor co-expression score, uh, which was defined, as you remember earlier, as you can like multiply those distributions together, or you can find the correlation or anything like that. Um, so that, that co-expression score. And if we feed this information along with the neighbor, surrounding neighborhood into an encoder, we can then get a new kind of updated uh, embedding of this communication. Um, and what's great about this is we can just throw away that result because we don't really care about what embedding we get and instead uh, look at the attention that was learned to each one of these ligand receptor pairs. So, Again, we, we don't really care because we can use deep graph InfoMax again, right? So we don't really care about what this embedding is. We care about kind of what are the important weights and attention that was given to each one of these ligand receptor pairs. And that can tell us which ligand receptor pairs are more reliable than others. Um, in addition, because we're looking at this kind of larger neighborhood, uh, we're not limited to just a ligand receptor pair, but rather more complex patterns such as a l secreted ligand from a sender cell to a receptor on a receiver cell, which then sends out a different ligand from, uh, to a 
new uh, receptor on a new receiver cell. So you can have these more complex patterns that the, the model will learn. And so how well does this actually work? So this is kind of the best that we can do for this validation <laughs> at the moment. Um, but if we take a human lymph node where we know kind of what the uh, uh, expected um, uh, uh, communication should be because there are these canonical uh, ligand receptor pairs that are present within the human lymph node. Uh, specifically, we looked at the T cell zone because uh, there are some very uh, popular ones there. For example, CCL19, CCR7 is a canonical T cell homing signal that is present mainly within the T cell zone. Um, so when we run uh, NEST, which is what we call our model for neural network in spatial transcriptomics, uh, we found that the CCL19 CCR7 was the second highest, uh, most frequent communication. So this is pretty exciting to see. Uh, but there's also other kinds of um, CCL21 CCR4 or CCL21 CCR7 are other canonical signals happening within this region. So that was pretty great to see. Um, and we can visualize this <coughs> by drawing uh, little arrows from spot to spot to show particularly the CCL19, CCR7 communication uh, on top of the entire tissue. And you can see it's really um, overlapping on the T cell zone area. And this is for the high importance. But um, if we increase the, the importance threshold that we're interested in, like increase the, the minimum attention score, you can see like at 95% and 99%, they uh, are still all mainly within the T cell zone regions. Um, so this kind of shows that this appears to be working pretty well. Um, and what's important to know is that uh, uh, going along with the spatial plays a role, uh, within the T cell zone, the CCL19 CCR7 is not among the most highly expressed uh, ligand receptor pairs. However, if we look at the attention score, it is one of the most important ones, right? So these were all considered noise. These are probably real signals, but um, uh, CCL19, CCR7 is one of the top. So um, this is all pretty exciting to see. And so when we apply it to that uh, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma tissue, uh, we get a uh, figure that looks like this, um, where uh, if you zoom in, you can see which spot is talking to which other spot. Again, we can do this using um, newer spatial, tra spatial transcriptomics technology, such as Visium HD. So you can do single cell analysis with this as well. So instead of spots, they can be cells. Um, and we've colored the, each of these little mini networks by connected component to see where in the tissue they are present. Um, and that's important because when we pile up all of the different ligand receptor pairs by which are the, the most frequent tumor stroma or tumor tumor communications. Um, we see a lot that makes sense like TGF beta one and, um, and FN1 and insulin. But uh, we also see some like PLXMB2 met, which are present mostly within one particular region of tissue. Uh, and this is pretty great because it turns out that PLXMB2 is um, as, uh, becoming increasingly associated with pancreatic cancer as a potential biomarker. Uh, and indeed, when we plot it on top of the tissue, uh, we see that it seems to be mostly present within one location, this classical region, rather than over here, which is basal or mixed regions, uh, showing that this, there might be these specific kind of communications occurring uh, that, are, that are subtype specific spatially resolved. So this is kind of an example of how you can use these kinds of tools in order to identify like a particular biomarker that you can then further validate in the uh, wet lab. Um, so uh, with that, uh, that's kind of all I wanted to go over today. Um, so hopefully you learned about that uh, role of context, why cell cell communication can be important, uh, different kind of single cell sequencing um, technology, how it works, uh, how, uh, the overall view of these algorithms work, uh, how cell phone DB and cell chat kind of work, and uh, how we can use spatial transcriptomics and NEST in order to more robustly identify um, 
these uh, these communications. So yeah, with that, um, 